In the last video, I talked about different parts of the brain and what they do. Um, but now I think I should just explain to you how we figured that stuff out. Uh, what we basically do nowadays is called neuroimaging. But back in the old times, you know, back before we had modern technology, researchers uh, of the brain, they had to use different kinds of methods. So generally, they did one of two things. They would either do what's called like exploratory brain surgery, where they would destroy parts of the brain to see how that affects a person. Or they would autopsy a person who had just like an accident that resulted in damage to the brain. So what a lot of these people were doing, because you know not many people would volunteer to get their brain cut apart, what most of these scientists were doing was they were just kind of hoping to meet somebody who has some strange brain disorder so that they could then observe their behavior and then take note of which parts of the brain were destroyed so then they can connect the dots and say okay this person had like emotional problems and this part of the brain was damaged so that part of the brain must have to do with emotion so that's how that's how we did this kind of research for quite a long time uh, one of the most classic examples of one of these kinds of what's called a case study would be the story of Phineas Gage. Now I have a, a link to um, a video about Phineas Gage uh, in the description. Make sure you check that out. It's a really interesting uh, case study. But besides these kinds of, you know, individuals that have damage to some part of their brain, besides that, we really didn't have much else we could do. And it isn't until relatively recently that we developed the first real brain, like, imaging technology. You, you could argue that electroencephalography, or EEG, is the first true, like, neuroimaging device because it's the first device that really allows us to detect brain functioning. You know, no surgery required. You just put on this really awesome looking hat with all these little, you know, detectors on it. And this device will uh, detect, amplify, and record the electrical activity inside your brain. So this is still used today. It's a really effective way to measure brain activity. But it doesn't really produce like a picture. Like when we talk about neuroimaging, we, we think of pictures of the brain. So it wasn't until a bit later that we started to develop that kind of neuroimaging capability. So some of the first kinds of uh, neuroimaging techniques we developed were like structural scans, uh, structural imaging. This is a kind of neuroimaging that just allows us to see the physical composition of the brain. Uh, you would want to do this to, for example, just study which all the different parts of the brain and what they look like, but also you could use this to detect abnormalities, like maybe a tumor. Like if you're looking for a brain tumor, then you should get a structural scan. And there's two basic kinds of structural scans you can do. You can do a CT scan or a CAT scan. You can, it's computerized tomography or computed axial tomography. It all, it all means the same thing. It's just a computer-enhanced x-ray of the brain from a number of different angles. So this will just allow you to kind of go through all the different parts of the brain that you've scanned and look for those kind of structural abnormalities. But like I mentioned, this is an x-ray scan. And if you know anything about x-rays, you know that x-rays are not really that good for you. X-ray radiation is considered a carcinogen, actually. So repeated exposure to any carcinogen, including x-rays, will definitely result in uh, problems, you know, like cancer, for example, or other kinds of developmental disorders. So as a result of, you know, the ha potential harm of x-rays, uh, researchers and medical doctors have tried really hard to find safer alternatives. Thankfully, they did. Uh, they developed something called magnetic resonance imaging. Of course, it's more expensive than a CAT scan, but no x-rays are involved. What it does is it uses a strong magnetic field to produce a 3D image of the brain. Now, if it seems strange that a magnet could produce a picture of the brain, well, 
basically you would have to take a physics class to really understand what I'm talking about now but basically magnetism and electricity are just two sides of the same coin and your brain is full of all these little neurons that have different electrical charges <clears throat> so we can use this magnet to basically like feel those electrical charges we can use this magnet to f kind of you know reach inside your skull and feel what it looks like but like I said you'd have to take a physics class to really understand the connection between electricity and magnetism so these structural scans are really great for just looking at the structure of the brain but they don't tell us anything about what the brain is actually doing like in the previous video I talked about how this part of the brain is involved in vision and this part of the brain is involved in hearing and so on and we were able to figure out a lot of that stuff using what's called functional imaging techniques so a functional brain scan will allow you to see which parts of the brain are more active during any particular time one of the most popular functional imaging techniques because of how cheap and safe it is would be functional magnetic resonance imaging now when I say it's cheap I don't mean that it's cheap I just mean relatively it doesn't cost a lot in fact a single scan in an fMRI is incredibly expensive but the way this works the way functional magnetic resonance imaging works or fMRI is it just it measures your blood flow in your brain so it just looks at which parts of your brain are sucking in more blood and it creates a picture of that and the assumption we have is that the parts of your brain that are sucking in more blood those are the parts of your brain that are more active and I have a, a video linked in the description down below on fMRI uh, you should definitely check that out because it's, it's a really cool video and it shows what the machines look like it shows how they work and the kind of images they produce so you should definitely check that out but other kinds of uh, functional imaging techniques would include things like positron emission tomography or PET scan that's a computer generated uh, color image of glucose consumption so now instead of looking at blood flow we're just looking at which parts of the brain are consuming the most glucose the assumption is basically the same you know the parts that the brain that consume the most glucose are the parts that are the most active then there's uh, magnetoencephalography so it's very similar to electroencephalography or EEG so but there's a few important differences like you definitely get a much cooler looking hat with magnetoencephalography and what it's doing now is not simply just looking at brainwave activity in the brain uh, through the skull it's also able to do this at a much you know faster more accurate way and then there's single photon emission computed tomography or SPECT this uses a gamma camera to measure uh, gamma ray emitting radioisotopes so instead of you know measuring blood flow or glucose now it's me measuring this kind of gamma radiation now your brain doesn't naturally give off this radiation though so what we do is we actually have to inject the person with a radioactive like gamma tracer and then later on when we scan them what we're what we're scanning is just where those tracers ended up and the assumption is you know where those tracers end up you know where that blood sends these tracers is the part of the brain that is the most active but don't don't worry about people that are becoming you know radioactive nobody's gonna turn into the Hulk or anything like that because they got injected with a tracer the amount of radioactivity that's involved here is pretty minuscule and then there's a uh, near-infrared spectroscopy or NIRS you can also call it diffuse optical tomography or diffuse optical imaging it's got a bunch of different names but the the basic way it works is that it uses near infrared light to generate images of uh, hemoglobin consumption in the brain so here instead of using radiation or anything else like magnets or whatever now it's using near infrared light so that's a pretty cool uh, use for uh, this kind of technology <clears throat> 